Happy Independence Day. I believe it was 245 years ago now that our nation declared our independence from Great Britain. Great Britain, did I say that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we think of independence, there's a, another word that we associate with that, especially today. Where we are celebrating our fill in the blank. What is it? Our freedom. Freedom is something that, that just comes to mind on July 4th. We celebrate our freedom, we celebrate our independence. But I want to ask the question do we understand what freedom means? You know, as Americans, we have a very definite idea of what freedom really means. We, we talk about independence and that rugged individualism. You know, every man for himself and every man just takes, he's free to do what he wants, pursue whatever he wants. That's an Americanized view of freedom. But I think as we look in our text today, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. If you want to go ahead and turn there. I think in our text today, we're going to find that Paul touts maybe a slightly different perspective on freedom. So let's read together. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26. Paul writes, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not know, or you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promise that your word does not return to you empty or void. So your word has gone forth already this morning, and I pray that it will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. Every time we open this book, Lord, you're speaking to us and you're teaching us something that you want us to know. And so, Lord, just speak to us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. See, in these verses, Paul calls us to freedom, but then he begins to redefine the term as very differently than Americans would define the term freedom. He says, do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. If you look in other translations, it uses the word flesh. Do not indulge the flesh. Do not indulge the sinful nature. But instead, serve one another. I think we'll see two uh, contrasting, um, 
Two contrasting approaches to what freedom looks like and how we pursue our freedoms in these verses. The first one that we'll see is kind of ties back to that term he used, that, that flesh, that sinful nature. We'll call it the sovereignty of self. The sovereignty of self. First of all, let's dig into that sinful nature, that, that term flesh there. What, what is that about? It equals a, a Greek term called sarx. It's a real easy word to say, but it's a loaded word. Basically, sarx is a sinful nature. It's our human nature apart from any divine influence in its rawest form. Our human nature in its rawest form, which means we are prone to sin and we are opposed to God. That is our human nature. That is our default setting as human beings. When we come into this world, we're born into a sinful nature. And so it's just natural for us to, to oppose God it's natural for us to pursue selfish uh, uh, sovereignty of self. And as we do that, that's how we reveal that sinful nature and that, that flesh within us. So we'll talk about a little bit about, we've already talked about what it is or how we define it. But what are some of its desires, some of the things that it does, and then ultimately we'll talk about its destiny. So the desires of the self, of that sinful nature, of the flesh, Paul talks about those. First of all, he says they're contrary to the spirit. So he draws that clear distinction. The flesh and the spirit are very different things. We're familiar with the flesh because it comes naturally. The spirit, not so much. It's the, the two coexist, but there's not this passive coexistence because there is a direct, there is an active opposition of the flesh towards the spirit. Does that make sense? There, we, it's just a part of our nature. It's who we are and it's what we do. We oppose the spirit. We are naturally selfish. We want to do what we want to do. We want to, there's a call, this call of freedom. We want to be free to do what we want to do without any consequences. That's the flesh. That's sarks. That's our sinful nature. And Paul describes the deeds of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. I don't know that I'll read all of those. I was tempted to just have you raise your hand as we come to each one that you've done, but no, we won't do that. So, <laughs> and, but I do want to point out, that's not an exhaustive list. That is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of other things that could be added on to that list. One of the phrases that he uses there at the very end of, verse, uh, of, the, of the list, he says, and the like. So he gives this, it, it pretty was, it was a pretty much a long list, but then he ends the, the sentence with, and the like. So he says, this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of other things that could be on this list. But those are the behaviors of the flesh. And when we act out of selfishness, out of our sinful nature, those are just some of the things that we might get involved in. I don't know how many of us would be able to uh, uh, relate to some of these, but this is this is not a very glamorous list. It's, it's not a really good list. I don't, even if we were able to relate, I don't know that we'd want to admit <laughs> that we could relate to these things. But I bet if we really spent some time and were honest with ourselves, there are some things that we could find that we're, we've done. And if we wanted to even think about it, and some of those things that we might find within ourselves would fall under that and the like category. The bottom line is we're all ruled by 
sovereignty of self. You see, verse 26 tells us that we become conceited and that we provoke and envy each other. It goes, verse 15 tells us that the result, the destiny that we're, uh, that we're destined for is to be in division, conflict, ultimately destruction. And then verse 21 is kind of the clincher we will not inherit the kingdom of God. I, I tell you, the, 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 the sovereignty of self might be better described as the tyranny of self. The tyranny of self. Because when it really boils down to it, it's no freedom at all. You see, freedom as we define it, especially as Americans, has a serious flaw. See, it doesn't offer freedom at all. Instead, we like to exert our so-called freedom to justify evil. Think about this. We justify abortion by calling it freedom of choice. We justify blasphemy by calling it freedom of speech. And we justify idolatry by calling it freedom of religion. You see how easy we can justify evil just by exerting our so-called freedoms. You see, sovereignty of the self rejects and opposes God. It lives in constant conflict with others. Sovereignty of the self craves and demands more and more indulgence in the sinful nature and, and the behaviors associated with it. The reality is that sovereignty of the self doesn't offer freedom, but it becomes a slave master and it robs us of the very freedoms that we think we're enjoying and pursuing. The world offers something it calls freedom, but it's really the opposite of freedom. And sovereignty of self just calls us deeper and deeper into slavery and bondage that will never ever deliver the freedom that we're seeking. I'm really glad that Paul balanced these verses out with another perspective <laughs> because that one that we just covered is not very hopeful. But Paul also describes a different kind of sovereignty that truly does bring freedom. It's a sovereignty of the spirit. And he defines that in verses 16 through 18. He talks about this the spirit, when you look up that word, the, the Greek word is pneuma. It starts with a silent P, pneuma. It's where we get our word pneumatics from, you know, air pressure and those kinds of things. And really, it means spirit or wind or breath. And that's, that's what the word spirit, it, how it's defined. In verse 17, Paul points out that the spirit is contrary to the flesh. You remember I mentioned that the spirit and the flesh, they don't just peacefully coexist. There is a struggle between the two, and both sides are equally aggressive, are equally the aggressors. <laughs> it does not seek uh, to fill selfish desires. The spirit does not seek for, to fill our, fulfill our special, our selfish desires. I guess a good contrast there between the spirit and the flesh is the spirit is about obedience, where the flesh is about opposition and selfishness. So those are the desires of the spirit. What are the deeds of the spirit? Well, verse 13 and 14 says that we should 
serve one another. Paul points out that the whole law is wrapped up in this one command. What he's really referring back to is what Jesus taught. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, I won't give you just one, I'll give you two. And the second one, Paul quotes right here. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's the second and of the greatest commandments. But it's just as important as the first. That's what Jesus said. But Paul goes a little bit further in verses 22 and 23. He describes the fruits of the Spirit. And we all know those. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I think I got gentleness and goodness flip-flop, didn't I? I always sing that little song in my head so I can remember all of them. <laughs> but the fruits of the Spirit, those are the things, you know, when you think of the word fruit, you go into the grocery store, you find fruit in a certain section. It's in the produce section, right? Well, that's what is being produced in our lives is the fruits of the Spirit when we have the sovereignty of the Spirit in our lives. We went through that big, long list of all of these deeds that are done by the self when the sovereignty of the self is in control. And it compares, and it's, it's a big, huge contrast between the fruits of the Spirit. You see, when we are... When we are living under the sovereignty of the Spirit, we're spared from law. We're spared from law. We have true freedom that comes apart from the law. Because what I need to point out is if you go and read the verses prior to our passage today, Paul's having a discussion with the Galatians. And what are they talking about? They're talking about circumcision. Circumcision was a part of the Old Testament law. There were some in Galatia who were trying to force new, new followers, new believers, to be circumcised. And Paul's saying that's totally unnecessary because when we live under the sovereignty of the Spirit, we are free apart from the law. There's also a destiny associated with the sovereignty of the Spirit. And that destiny is that in verse 16, Paul says, we should walk by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Sovereignty of the Spirit. What are some of the things that we can take away? First of all, sovereignty of the Spirit shuns the flesh shuns the flesh. We have to actively engage on one side or the other. We talked about there's no peaceful coexistence. There is active war between the flesh and the spirit. And each and every one of us choose which side we're going to fight on. Unfortunately, on the flesh, that's something that comes naturally, but it's still something that we have to choose to do. Fighting on the side of the spirit is unnatural, therefore it's more difficult, but it is definitely something that we have to decide to do. We have to shun the flesh. Sovereignty of the spirit serves others rather than self. When we are focused on the needs of others and less on ourselves, that's when we're going to experience that walking with the Spirit, living by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. But you're also going to experience those fruits of the Spirit that begin to be produced from your life. And it's really fun when you start noticing those things happening. You're experiencing love and joy and peace. But it's even more fun sometimes when you're experiencing this patience. You're like, wait a minute, I, normally I would have lost my head in that situation. And you see the changes that the Spirit is bringing about in your life. Patience, 
kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If you're going to be able to shun the flesh, you have to have some self-control. Sovereignty of the Spirit finds true freedom by walking in the Spirit. The battle lines have been drawn between the Spirit and the flesh. And we can't just straddle. We can't just hop back and forth. In order to be successful and enjoy the freedom that God intended for us, we have to walk consistently, regularly, in step with the Spirit. When we do walk with the Spirit, we begin to notice how we are automatically fulfilling the law. It's not something that we're pursuing and trying to accomplish the law. We see the requirements of the law being satisfied but what, by what's, what the Spirit is producing within us. And when love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithful, self-control, self when those things start flowing from us, the law is being satisfied. Following the law does not become something, it's, it's not a premeditated objective. I have to wake up every morning and make sure I'm checking off this list of things I've got to do. That's not what freedom is. But it's all, more like a, a, a default preset. At the end of the day, before I go to bed, I look at this list and I say, oh yeah, I did that. Yeah, I did that. I did that. But it really wasn't me. It was the Spirit as He reigned in my life, as I walked with Him. A byproduct of walking in the Spirit is fulfilling the law. That's the kind of freedom that Paul called the Galatians to. That's the kind of true freedom that God calls you and I to. It was a kind of freedom that was modeled by Jesus himself. And Paul, again, describes that kind of freedom that Jesus modeled in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish, selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you realize that as we read those verses, Jesus was free. He was free. He was free to wait, walk away from all of that. But in his freedom, he made a choice. He made a choice on which side of the battle he would engage. And he followed through. And that example stands for us today. As we come to communion, we're reminded of Jesus' example. That is why we observe communion, so that we won't forget his gift to us and the example that he set for us. 
And so as we come to these elements, I want us, before we come to these elements, I want us to just take a moment. And I want us to, to think about the contrasting definitions of freedoms that we've talked about this morning. Let's talk about who is sovereign. Let's, let's think about who is sovereign in my life. Do I live under the sovereignty of self? Or do I live under the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit? Just have a time of quiet prayer. Lord, as we come to your table this morning and today being Independence Day in America, it's good to be reminded about the freedom that you provided for us and what true freedom really means. Lord, we acknowledge and recognize that there is a struggle within each and every one of us that goes on every day. That our flesh struggles against the Spirit. And we have to choose on which side we will engage. Lord, we know that there's many times that we engage on the wrong side. There are many things that we've done, many thoughts that we have entertained that wage war against your spirit. And Father, we just now, right at this time, we just take a few moments to bring those to you as embarrassing, ugly, as bad as they may be. We bring them to you and we lay them at your feet. And we ask for your spirit to take over that battle for us. To give us victory. That's what these elements are about. As we come to your table, Lord, we remember the sacrifice that you made so that we could experience true freedom. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much. And we love you. going to ask you as you are ready if you would come and receive these elements just take the cup and the wafer and return to your seat and then we will partake together you come Thank you. 
We're all very familiar with the story how Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room. It was the last time that he would eat or drink with them in this world. Scripture tells us that Jesus took a piece of bread and he began to break it and pass it out amongst his disciples. And he told them, this bread represents my body that is broken for you. And as we eat this together, we remember. Let's eat. And then scripture tells us that in the same way he blessed the cup and passed it among his disciples and he said this wine represents my blood my blood that is shed for you as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup do this and one picture, a symbol of God's love for us, his amazing love. And as we've talked about, he is a God who loves us so much. He wants us to experience freedom, true freedom, not this cheap imitation that the world offers. He wants to, us to experience a true freedom that comes from walking in the Spirit. I think it would be appropriate for us to just sing of his amazing love one more time this morning and then we'll be dismissed. sovereignty of the Spirit. Have your way in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great 4th of July and a great week. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks.